Okay, so I am um, going to share with you since it's Monday magic reading, you know, we're doing lots of reading. I thought you guys might like to uh, read this mentor text with me. We were actually going to share this with you with the social issues uh, reading unit. So as I'm reading this to you, it would be really great if you would try to really think about the protagonist in this story and what kind of problems this boy is going through. And then we'll do more with the story later. But let's just get our feet wet, so to speak, a little figurative language there, um, with what's happening in the story. It's called Inside Out from the Circuit, Stories from the Life of a Migrant Child by Francisco Jimenez. I remember being hit on the wrists with a 12-inch ruler because I did not follow directions in class. Roberto answered in a mildly angry tone when I asked him about his first year of school. But how could I, he continued, the teacher gave them in English. So what did you do, I asked, rubbing my wrists. I always guessed what the teacher wanted me to do, and when she did not use the ruler on me, I knew I had guessed right, he responded. Some of the kids made fun of me when I tried to say something in English and got it wrong. He went on, I had to repeat first grade. I wish I had not asked him, but he was the only one in the family, including Papa and Mama, who had attended school. I walked away. I did not speak or understand English either, and I already felt anxious. Besides, I was excited about going to school for the first time. That following Monday, it was late January, and we had just returned a week before from Krakorum, where my family picked cotton. We settled in Tent City, a labor camp owned by Sheeny Strawberry Farms, located about 10 miles east of Santa Maria. Sorry, Sheehy Strawberry Farms. On our first day of school, Roberto and I got up early. I dressed in a pair of overalls, which I hated because they had suspenders, and a flannel checkered shirt, which Mama had bought at the Goodwill store. As I put on my cap, Roberto reminded me that it was bad manners to wear a hat indoors. I thought of leaving it at home so that I would not make the mistake of forgetting to take it off in class, but I decided to wear it. Papa always wore a cap and I did not feel completely dressed for school without it. On our way out to catch the school bus, Roberto and I said goodbye to Mama. Papa had already left to look for work, either topping carrots or thinning lettuce. Mama stayed home to take care of Trumpeta and to rest because she was expecting another baby. When the school bus arrived, Roberto and I climbed in and sat together. I took the window seat and on the way watched endless rows of lettuce and cauliflower whiz by. The furrows that came up to the two-lane road looked like giant legs running alongside us. The bus made several stops to pick up kids, and with each stop the noise inside got louder. Some kids were yelling at the top of their lungs, and I did not know what they were saying. I was getting a headache. Roberto had his eyes closed and was frowning. I did not disturb him. I figured he was getting a headache, too. By the time we got to the Main Street School, the bus was packed. The bus driver parked in front of the red brick building and opened the door. We all poured out. Roberto, who had attended the school the year before, accompanied me to the main office, where we met the principal, Mr. Sims, a tall, red-headed man with bushy eyebrows and hairy hands. He patiently listened to Roberto who was using the little English he knew, managed to enroll me in the first grade. Mr. Sims walked me to my classroom. I liked it as soon as I saw it because unlike our tent, it had wooden floors, electric lights, and heat. It felt cozy. He introduced me to my teacher, Miss Scalapino, who smiled, repeating my name, Francisco. It was the only word I understood the whole time she and the principal talked. They repeated it each time they glanced at me. After he left, she showed me at my de to my desk, which was at the end of the row of desks closest to the windows. There were no other kids in the room yet. I sat at my desk, and my hand ran over its wooden top. It was full of scratches and dark, almost black ink spots. I opened the top, and inside were a book, a box of crayons, a yellow ruler, a thick pencil, and a pair of scissors. To my left under the windows was a dark wooden counter the length of the room. On top of it, right next to my desk, was a caterpillar in a large jar. 
It looked just like the ones I had seen in the fields. It was yellowish green with black bands and it moved very slowly without making any sound. I was about to put my hand in the jar to touch the caterpillar when the bell rang. All the kids lined up outside the classroom door and then walked in quietly and took their seats. Some of them looked at me and giggled. Embarrassed and nervous, I looked at the caterpillar in the jar. I did this every time someone looked at me. Miss Scalapino started speaking to the class and I did not understand a word she was saying. The more she spoke, the more anxious I became. By the end of the day, I was very tired of hearing Miss Scalapino talk because the sounds made no sense to me. I thought that perhaps by paying close attention, I would begin to understand, but I did not. I only got a headache. And that night when I went to bed, I heard her voice in my head. For days, I got headaches from trying to listen until I learned a way out. When my head began to hurt, I let my mind wander. Sometimes I imagined myself flying out of the classroom and over the fields where Papa worked and landing next to him and surprising him. But when I daydreamed, I continued to look at the teacher and pretend I was paying attention because Papa told me it was disrespectful not to pay attention, especially to grown-ups. It was easier when Miss Scalapino read to the class from a book with illustrations because I made up my own stories in Spanish based on the pictures. She held the book with both hands above her head and talked about the classroom to make sure everyone got a chance to see the pictures, most of which were animals. I enjoyed looking at them and making up stories, but I wished I understood what she was reading. In time, I learned some of my classmates' names. The one I heard the most and therefore learned first was Curtis. Curtis was the biggest, strongest, and most popular kid in the class. Everyone wanted to be his friend and to play with him. He was always chosen captain when the kids formed teams. Since I was the smallest kid in the class and did not know English, I was chosen last. I preferred to hang around Arthur, one of the boys who knew a little Spanish. During recess, he and I played on the swings, and I pretended to be a Mexican movie star like George Negrete or Pedro Infant, riding a horse and singing the corridos we often heard on the car radio. I sang them to Arthur as we swung back and forth, going as high as we could. But when I spoke to Arthur in Spanish and Miss Scalapino heard me, she said, no, with body and soul, her head turned left and right a hundred times a second and her index finger moved from side to side as fast as a windshield wiper on a rainy day. English, English, she repeated. Arthur avoided me whenever she was around. Often during recess, I stayed with the caterpillar. Sometimes it was hard to spot him because he blended with the green leaves and twigs. Every day I brought him leaves from the pepper and cypress trees that grew on the playground. Just in front of the caterpillar lying on top of the cabinet was a picture book of caterpillars and butterflies. I went through it page by page, studying all the pictures and running my fingers lightly over the caterpillars and the bright wings of the butterflies and the many patterns on them. I knew caterpillars turned into butterflies because Roberto had told me, but I wanted to know more. I was sure information was in the words written underneath each picture in large black letters. I tried to figure them out by looking at the pictures. I did this so many times that I could close my eyes and see the words, but I could not understand what they meant. My favorite time in school was when we did art, which was every afternoon. After the teacher had read to us, since I did not understand Miss Scalapino when she explained the art lesson, she let me do whatever I wanted. I drew all kinds of animals, but mostly birds and butterflies. I sketched them in pencil and then colored them using every color in my crayon box. Miss Scalapino even tackled one of my drawings up on the board for everyone to see. After a couple of weeks, it disappeared and I did not know how to ask where it had gone. One cold Thursday morning during recess, I was the only kid on the playground with a jacket. Mr. Sims must have noticed I was shivering because that afternoon after school, 
he took me to his office and pulled out a green jacket from a large cardboard box that was full of used clothes and toys. He handed it to me and gestured for me to try it on. It smelled like graham crackers. I put it on, but it was too big, so he rolled up the sleeves about two inches to make it fit. I took it home and showed it off to my parents. They smiled. I liked it because it was green and it hid my suspenders. The next day, I was on the playground wearing my new jacket and waiting for the first bell to ring when I saw Curtis coming at me like an angry bull. Aiming his head directly at me and pulling his arm straight back with his hands clenched, he stomped up to me and started yelling. I did not understand him, but I knew it had something to do with the jacket because he began to pull on it, trying to take it off of me. Next thing I knew, he and I were on the ground wrestling. Kids circled around us. I could hear them yelling Curtis's name and something else. I knew I had no chance, but I stubbornly held onto my jacket. He pulled on one of the sleeves so hard that he ripped it at the shoulder. He pulled on the right pocket and it ripped. Then Miss Scalapino's face appeared above. She pushed Curtis off of me and grabbed me by the back of the collar and picked me up off the ground. It took all the power I had not to cry. On the way to the classroom, Arthur told me that Curtis claimed the jacket was his and that he had lost it at the beginning of the year. He also said that the teacher told Curtis and me that we were being punished. We had to sit on the bench during recess for the rest of the week. I did not see the jacket again. Curtis got it, but I never saw him wear it. For the rest of the day, I could not even pretend I was paying attention to Miss Gallopino. I was so embarrassed. I laid my head on top of my desk and closed my eyes. I kept thinking about what had happened that morning. I wanted to fall asleep and wake up to find it was only a dream. The teacher called my name, but I did not answer. I heard her walk up to me. I did not know what to expect. She gently shook me by the shoulders. Again, I did not respond. Miss Scalapino must have thought I was asleep because she left me alone even when it was time for recess and everyone left the room. Once the room was quiet, I slowly opened my eyes. I had had them closed for so long that the sunlight coming through the windows blinded me. I rubbed my eyes with the back of my hands and then looked at my left to my left at the jar. I looked for the caterpillar but could not see it. Thinking it might be hidden, I put my hand in the jar and lightly stirred the leaves. To my surprise, the caterpillar had spun itself into a cocoon and had attached itself to a small twig. It looked like a tiny cotton bulb, just like Roberto had said it would. I gently stroked it with my index finger, picturing it asleep and peaceful. At the end of the school day, Miss Gallopino gave me a note to take home to my parents. Papa and Mama did not know how to read, but they did not have to. As soon as they saw my swollen upper lip and scratches on my left cheek, they knew what the note said. When I told them what had happened, they were just, they were very upset, but relieved that I did not disrespect the teacher. For the first several days, going to school and facing Miss Gallopino was harder than ever. However, I slowly began to get over what happened that Friday. Once I got used to the routine in school and I picked up some English words, I felt more comfortable in class. On Wednesday, May 23rd, a few days before the end of the school year, Miss Gallopino took me by surprise. After we were all sitting down and she had taken roll, which means attendance, she called for everyone's attention. I did not understand what she said, but I heard her say my name as she held up a blue ribbon. She then picked up my drawing of the butterfly that had disappeared weeks before and held it up for everyone to see. She walked up to me and handed me the drawing in the silk blue ribbon that had a number one printed on it in gold. I knew then I had received first prize for my drawing. I was so proud. I felt like bursting out of my skin. My classmates, including Curtis, stretched their necks to see the ribbon. That afternoon during our free period, I went over to check on the caterpillar. I turned the jar, trying to see the cocoon. It was beginning to crack open. I excitedly cried out, look, look, pointing to it. The whole class, like a swarm of bees, rushed over to the counter. 
Miss Scalapino took the jar and placed it on the top of a desk in the middle of the classroom so everyone could see it. For the next several minutes, we all stood there watching the butterfly emerge from the cocoon. In slow motion, at the end of the day, just before the last bell, Miss Scalapino picked up the jar and took the class outside to the playground. She placed the jar on the ground and we all circled around her. I had a hard time seeing over the other kids. So Miss Scalapino called me and motioned for me to open the jar. I broke through the circle, knelt on the ground and unscrewed the top. Like magic, the butterfly flew into the air, fluttering its wings up and down. After school, I waited in line for my bus in front of the playground. I proudly carried the blue ribbon in my right hand and the drawing in the other. Arthur and Curtis came up and stood behind me to wait for their bus. Curtis motioned for me to show him the drawing again. I held it up so he could see it. He really likes it, Francisco, Arthur said to me in Spanish. Como se dice atio en de inglés? I asked. Sorry, guys, I don't speak Spanish. It's yours, answered Arthur. It's yours, I repeated, handing the drawing to Curtis. All right, now what I would like for you to think about, because we're going to do a lot of work with this story on Mondays, but we're going to start small. So I would like for you to think about what makes Francisco different, right? What makes him different? And I would like for you to find at least somewhere between three and five pieces of evidence of that. All right. So as I just, you know, went up to the top of the page and I'm actually looking at this myself and this part where it says, and I'm going to use this pencil and I'll use the red color. Um, right here. Some of the kids made fun of me when I tried to say something in English and got it wrong. He went on, I had to repeat first grade. All right. So this part where um, it's being incorrectly said, some of the kids made fun of me when I tried to say something in English and got it wrong. I had to repeat first grade. He went on, I had to repeat first grade. So um, this is what is being shared. I wish I had not asked him. So that part was um, him sharing to Francisco. All right, but we're still looking for parts and we know that that has something to do um, with Francisco because Roberto is his brother, all right? I wish I had not asked him, but he was the only one in the family, including Papa and Mama who had attended school. I walked away. I did not speak. In so here's where he says he doesn't speak it either. I did not speak or understand English either, and I already felt anxious. All right. So that's just what I would like for you to do. All right. Look for three to five pieces of evidence that shows what the difficulties are. For Francisco. All right. And I will see you and we'll work more with this next Monday. There's a copy of this in your module one folder as well. So um, you can look at that separately. That's all. See you later.